chapter 12, starting at verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed you me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in abundance of possessions. And he told him this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no plans to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then you will get what you have prepared for yourself. This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have not storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than birds? Who are you to... Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the wildflowers grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If this is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink, or do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things, and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased, has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not fail, where no thief comes near, no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So as Pete comes up to preach, um, I'll pray for him and pray for us. Thanks. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word. Thank you uh, for your teaching. Thank you that we can see it today. And thank you for helping Pete as he's prepared to speak to us today. Pray that you would speak through him by your spirit as he preaches. Uh, have, help him to have the words to say uh, as, as he speaks to us. Help us to have ears to hear uh, what he says, ears to hear what you are saying through him. I pray that we would uh, leave this place changed, knowing you more, and knowing your call on our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Well, let me add my very warm welcome to that of Joel's earlier. And because I forgot last time I was doing this, I have question sheets. So if you would like a question sheet, um, there's uh, some sort of general space on the one side and a few specific questions on the other. I'll show those to you, maybe. Those will be coming around to you. If you haven't got a Bible, um, we've got Bibles in the back corner, so do feel free to go and get one of those. Now, that would be really helpful because you don't want to just hear my thoughts. We want to hear God and his word. So we're in Luke chapter 12. And as Joel's mentioned, we're taking uh, just a one-week pause or break in the middle of our Mark series. And today, we're looking at this parable, mostly. We're mostly looking at the first half of the passage that Beth has just read, which encourages us to get us to think, gets us to think about money. And money's not easy to talk about, is it, for us? Money feels private. It feels personal. All of us in this room are in different situations financially. Some young, some old, some with plenty, some with uh, little. For some, it's not a concern and a worry. For many, it might be. Um, perhaps particularly in our current financial situation and a, and a, and a, a challenging period of time um, in, in our country. So money might be an easy subject for us to avoid. It would be rather nice if Jesus avoided it, actually, wouldn't it? Because then we could... We could just carry on and, and not need to worry about what the Bible might say about money. We might not offend 
might not cause upset, might not cause grief or worry as we think about it. But the reality is that Jesus had masses to say about money. Many of Jesus' parables and a lot of his teaching actually focuses on money. It makes us think about what God would have us do with our money, how he wants us to view everything that we have, including our money. I read a, a line um, supposedly attributed to G.K. Chesterton, I'm not sure, but it said, um, you could have an interesting discussion as to whether or not Jesus believed in fairies. It would be an interesting conversation. But you can't have an interesting conversation or any debate about whether Jesus had a view on money, because absolutely he did. Did he believe in fairies? The Bible doesn't tell us. I don't think he did. Did he believe in the importance of money and what it does to our hearts and how we live out the Christian life in a world that has money and possessions and barns and iPhones and everything else? Absolutely. So we want to come to this passage, as to any passage, and think, how does Jesus want to shape my life if I am a follower of the Lord Jesus? What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus when it comes to my money? A couple of weeks ago in home group, Mike wrote, I thought, a couple of really helpful, really challenging questions for us in home group. The first question was, what do you love? I wonder if any of you remember the next couple of questions that came. If someone had access only to your diary and to your bank statement, what would they think that you love? That's a really challenging question, isn't it? I thought that was really well put. And let me reassure you, I am not here this morning because I've got all this, thing, all this sorted, any more than any of us who stand up every week preach because we have everything in life sorted and fixed. That is not the case. But if we are Christians, then all of life is to be submitted to God, even those things that feel like I'd like to keep them to myself, like money and possessions. If you're not a Christian, I want to be really clear this morning, what we're not saying is that we want your money. We won't be passing around a collection tray or bowl this morning, not because I think it's wrong if other places do, but we want you to be here, and we want you to hear the truth of God in his word through the Bible and in all that we do. We don't want you to pay for the privilege of doing so, or feel any way that we're after your money in order to be here. That's not what we're interested in. We want you first and foremost to come to understand who Jesus is. So be clear about that if you're, if you're not yet a Christian. Also, no matter how much money we give away, we're not going to become a Christian. Nothing that we do with our money turns us into a Christian. You cannot buy your way into a right relationship with God. But, if you don't know, every single penny that we use here as a church comes from giving from those in the building here this morning and those who aren't here. Everything that we spend on our staff, on all of our ministry, on using this building, every single penny, we don't get any from an outside organization, it all comes from the generous giving of those who are part of the church family. So I wanted to really acknowledge that and say thank you. Um, I sit, as an elder, I sit with a sort of a particular eye on financial stuff, and it is an amazing blessing to see how year after year after year after year, with some ups and downs, and we come to those challenges as we face them, but God, through God's people, is faithful and has blessed us enormously over the last 19 years. So I hope that feels like an encouragement for all of us as we look at this passage and think, what does this say to me about money and possessions? And I hope that you see that no matter who you are, no matter how long you've been a Christian, no matter how young or old, this is of relevance. For the younger people in the room, those perhaps not yet earning anything or very much at all, this is still of relevance to us. Jesus wants us to shape every part of our life, submit every part of our lives to him. And actually, I think the earlier that you start to do that, the easier it might be. If you're going to wait until you're earning a massive salary before you decide, ah, this is the moment when God wants me to give and be generous, well, giving quite a lot from a lot might be pretty hard. But maybe if you've got a part-time job, maybe students around. If you've not got very much, but you can choose to give some to God and to God's work, then that's a great place to start. You're also growing up in a world, it strikes me, that is enormously, enormously focused on money and possessions and stuff. I occasionally go into schools, I do workshops with schools, I talk to teenage kids and say, one of the things I ask them is, what, what are your ambitions? What do you want to be in the future? And I get all sorts of answers, some of which, I mean, Half of the boys in England, by the way, are going to be professional footballers. Not quite sure. Um, but the other half, they're going to be rich. 
doesn't matter how I'm going to do it, I'm going to be rich. So I even meet kids who go, I want to be like Andrew Tate. Not because I think they admire Andrew Tate for any, any part of his character, but because he's got loads of stuff, loads of money. So we are, oh, I've stopped growing up. You are growing up in a world, younger people, where, where those pulls to the things that, that will take your eye onto money, onto stuff, onto things that are amazing, is very, very real. So how do we as Christians face into that world? Well, let's look at this story. Let's look at what's going on here. Look down, Luke chapter 12, verse 13. Someone in the crowd, sorry, I do have some slides as well. There we go. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Sounds fair enough, doesn't it? Maybe you've got siblings. Maybe there's some inheritance that might come to you one day and you think, I want that to be divided equally. It's fair that I get some, that he gets some, that she gets some. You hope you don't have 19 siblings to share it between, like that story earlier. But, but teacher, tell my brother to share it equally between us. That sounds fair, doesn't it? But Jesus sees right through this question, this request, and he says it's not about fairness. It's about greed. Jesus says to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. This is not about fairness, this is about greed. This is about I want, I want. It's greed. So Jesus says, be careful, be on your guard, because greed is a problem. Life is more than just about having stuff. Life is not about an abundance of possessions. Glance down to, chapter, to verse 23. Beth read this for us as well. We're mostly staying uh, above that, but verse 23, life is more than food and the body more than clothes. He says to this man, if you focus on possessions, on money, on stuff, you're actually missing out on the reality of what life really is. You're settling for something far smaller. So Jesus, to illustrate this point, turns to this brilliant, pithy story, this parable about what's called here the rich fool. So, pause there. This guy's had a fabulous harvest. The, the ground has given him ma masses of crops. We don't know how much he's already got stored in his barns, but he's already got barns, and the barns are full. He gets this great big new crop, and he thinks to himself, here's a problem, what do I do? I've got to keep all of this stuff so I can keep getting richer and more and more satisfied. I know what I'll do. I'll rip my barns down, and I'll build more barns. More barns, bigger barns. That's got to be the solution, yeah? Perfect. More barns, bigger barns. Great. So he sets off to do that. And look then at verse 17. 18 and 19. Have a look here. Just look down or, or look at the screen. How many times do you see the word I, my, and myself here? This shows us totally where this man's focus is. Can you see them? He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my, my crops. This is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. And then I will store my surplus grain. You get in the point? I will say to myself, you've got masses. Fabulous. Well done. You've taken care of things. Now you're sorted. What a great guy I am. Now, this is in the Bible. Do you recognize who's missing from this story in the Bible at this stage? There's, there's, there's God. is yet to make an appearance in this parable. But, but the guy's saying, it's, it's all fine. It's, I've got everything. I have done this myself, me, myself, and I. It reminded me of this brilliant bit. You know this bit in, everyone know the film? Finding Nemo? Mine, 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 mine. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, I haven't just gone completely mad. Um, but it's a great moment in this film, Finding Nemo, when, when these seagulls are like, mine, 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 and they're fighting over it. It's, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. That's what's going on here, isn't it? It's my stuff. Look what the ground has made for me. I have done this. I will have bigger barns, more barns. Amazing. Oh, the new iPhone maybe he'd have had in there as well, I think, wouldn't he? And the latest whatever else. Man, mine, mine, mine. This guy has arrived. Yeah? By, by a first century and definitely a 21st century assessment, this guy's the real deal, isn't he? He should be a president. This is what we vote for. Maybe more over the pond than here, but it like, doesn't matter what they believe. They're wealthy. They must be great. Sorry to the American brothers and sisters in the room. Um, but, but that's it, isn't it? 
He's got lots of stuff. Brilliant, fantastic. He has arrived. And I just pause there and I just think, how do I feel about this guy at the moment in this story? And if I'm really honest, there's a part of me that's jealous of him. Bigger barns, more harvest, a bonus, a pay rise, even more into his pension. This guy, he's, he's got it sorted. This is brilliant. But absolutely, he can sit back and say, I've got plenty. I can take it easy into retirement. I can sit back and watch my 70-inch television. Life is good. There's the upgraded barn. There we go. Take life easy. Sit back, eat, drink, be merry. I have done this. Jesus says in the parable next, but God, God appears. God says to him, you fool. And I'm not sure the tone of voice to use here, actually. I'm not sure it's condemnation. I think there's sadness, actually, is how I read this. You fool. You fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? All this stuff that you have stored up, who's going to get it? What a fool. The problem is, the reason this guy's a fool is he has made his wealth, his possessions, his mine, mine, mine. That is his security. That's his comfort. That's his hope. That's what gives him safety. His possessions, his money, his stuff is what gives him security. And Jesus says, you're a fool. Because no matter how swanky and big your barns, no matter what sits on the driveway, no matter how much is in the bank account and in your pension, your life's going to be demanded from you at some point. And verse 21 then is really important. This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. I think that's really important. I, I think what this parable is not saying is that as Christians, it's wrong to have money. I don't think it's saying that we can't plan for the future, that we shouldn't even borrow money to buy a house or invest for the future or give inheritance to our children or to our grandchildren. Do you see what verse 21 says? It's not riches that are the problem. It's not having lots of money and earning a big bonus or earning a big salary. That's the problem. It's keeping it all for self and not being generous with it. That is the problem. This is how it would be for whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. That's the end of the parable. So what do we take from this? Two key things I want to pull out this morning. Firstly, guard against greed. That's what Jesus says, isn't it? Back in verse 15. Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Guard against greed, Jesus says. Multiple parables, multiple teaching from Jesus about money and our relationship and our view of money and possessions. Why? Because it drives a lie in our hearts that says, what matters is what I can do for myself. Mine, 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 mine. And it distracts us. I don't normally use lots of film references, but I have another one here. You know this one? Shiny. I'm not going to sing, don't worry. Um, but Moana, and I might, miss, I might misuse this illustration, actually, but basically it seems to me that there's all this shiny stuff going on in Moana. It's like, look at this distraction. I've, I've collected all these things that matter. Wow, look at all this shiny stuff. And meanwhile, here all other things are going on. Don't stretch the analogy too far. My point is, we can be distracted, can't we, by things that are shiny, by things that, are, that look good and feel good and great. But if we put our, our trust in those things, if we put our security in those things, our, our hope, our confidence, our trust in those things, then we're just believing shiny things that are going to fall to the bottom of the sea and rust away. So the harm in greed is that it takes us away from a, fuss, a trust in Jesus. I'm on safer territory here now, moving away from films. This is a Rottweiler. We have friends um, who have a Rottweiler and some tiny little dog as well, I forget. But they have a Rottweiler called Tank. It's a rather, rather nice name for a Rottweiler. And um, I was talking the other day about this Rottweiler. They basically have this Rottweiler because it looks rather imposing and it's a good guard dog. Um, and uh, the, 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 this friend of ours the other day, she was telling me that uh, they'd had a builder come around to look at something. And she's saying, Rottweilers will never be aggressive. They won't be offensive, but they are mighty good at being defensive. So she said, this guy came around and said, I got a funny sense from him. 
I felt that he was, I just didn't quite feel safe. And so the Rottweiler lay on the floor in front of her in the doorway and just made this noise, <laughs> looking at this man. And he would not let the man pass. He was guarding her from this person that was a threat to her, potentially. Jesus says, guard your hearts against greed because it is a dangerous enemy that can distract us and make us look at things that are shiny and bright and new and exciting but take us away from where our attention should be. Guard against greed. Where, where should we challenge ourselves? Where do we need to look? Where this afternoon do you need to reflect? I don't know what those things are. Where does greed creep in in your life? Where is it already taken over? Um, where does our daydreaming take us when we come to thinking about money or about things? Oh, if only I had dot, 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 then I'd be fine. If only I had a bit more, then I wouldn't need more. Then I wouldn't need to help. Then I could give some money away. Then I'd think about it less if just I had a bit more. Guard against greed, Jesus says. There are other attitudes that can come in with that, aren't there? Maybe envy. Oh, I can't believe they've got that. I've only got this. Maybe pride. Mine, mine, mine. Look at all this what, that I've done. Maybe just selfishness. We keep it to ourselves. The other thing I think that greed does, if we're greedy, I was reflecting on this this week very much, I, I think greed stops us from being grateful for what we do have. Because if we constantly long for more, then we're not satisfied with what we have, are we? You know, imagine those of us who are married or in a relationship, if you constantly long for a different partner, that would be terrible, wouldn't it? But you're like, you're basically saying, oh, you're not good enough, I, I, I need something different. Well, God has given us what we have, and we might need more at times, I totally understand. But if we, if we always long for different, for change, for more, for a bit of this and a bit of that, then we can't enjoy what we currently have. So I think an attitude of gratitude, a heart that says thank you for what we have and enjoys what we have. The other thing that I think is really important here is another G word. So we've got guard against greed, we've got have gratitude, but also we don't need to feel guilty. That's the, a danger here, I think, as well. You know, we could keep it all to ourselves, couldn't we, and be greedy, but I think we could also feel really guilty for using money for good things in this world. So we can use the money that, we've given, that God has given to us through our, through our work and through other sources. We can use that, and that's, that's right. We have families to look after. We have lives to live. The challenge is, do we turn a good thing from God into a God thing? Do we pursue money because it becomes to us like God? Or do we pursue God and then use money in ways that bring him glory as well? So guard against greed. Enjoy what we have. Be grateful. But also, don't... I don't think we have to feel guilty. What we can be, and what I think we're called to be, is generous and gracious. So, verse 21 again. This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. We're to be generous. We're to give towards God. Okay, great. So how do we do that? What does it mean to be generous, to give to God? That's what it says anyone who is not rich towards God. Well, if you flick forwards in your Bibles, just go to the book of Second Law Keepers, chapter 6. Oh, you'll probably find there isn't a book in your Bible called Second Law Keepers, actually. Um, but it would be nice, wouldn't it, if we could go to chapter and verse that says, give this much and then God will be happy with you and you'll be sorted. That would be good, wouldn't it? Ah, 10%. Great, the tithe. That's what the Old Testament said, wasn't it? Brilliant. So if we look then, let's see how that went for the Pharisees. Just go back, this book does exist in your Bible still. Luke chapter 11. The Pharisees, they knew their Old Testament. 10%, that's what I need to give. Woe to you, Pharisees, Jesus says. Chapter 11, verse 42. Because you give God a tenth of, not just your money, but of your mint, your ruin. Or they sit there in the spice cupboard. They get out all the spices, even five spice for my children. They get out all the spices and they divide them again. That 10% for Jesus, that 90% for us. That 10% for God, that... Brilliant, they do all of that. But Jesus says, what? You neglect justice, and you neglect the love of God. So you should have practiced the former. You should have done that giving, but without leaving the, the, the other undone. You should practice justice and love of God. See, Jesus says, it's not about a precise amount. It's not about a precise proportion. It's about the attitude of our hearts. Do I cling on to it with a closed hand? Mine, mine, mine. Or do I somehow look at what God gives me and think, how can I... Be generous and gracious with that. 
flick forward. Again, this one does exist. Uh, chapter 21 in Luke, we meet the widow who goes to the temple, and in the midst of other people putting in their money, this widow comes along, puts in two very small copper coins, and Jesus says, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave out of their wealth. She, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. She's commended because she's massively generous. Well, there's a tiny amount of money. She was generous-hearted, and she gave more than she could afford. So, for us, be generous and be gracious. We can practice generosity. It does take practice, I think. That's about money, but we could broaden it from money, couldn't we, into time, into how we serve, into how we use our gifts, uh, hospitality, other things. And maybe think about the questions we ask. How much do I have to give? Doesn't sound very generous, does it? That's not a generous-hearted question. How much can I give? How much do I need to keep? What do I need? What can I give to God? Do I spend first and give last if there's a bit left over, or do I think about giving first and then see where I am? That will be costly. There will be cost to that, I think. It's part of our taking up our cross and following Jesus. All of our life is to be changed as we live in submission to him. But I think it's also rewarding. It's amazing what we can do. We can do so much as a church family. We, we do what we do here. We support missionaries overseas. We want to do more and more of that stuff. As we grow ourselves in the knowledge and love of Jesus, we want to send others out. We want to bring others in to come to know and love Jesus themselves. So we can be generous and gracious, but again, not guilted. I am not standing here today saying, the Bible tells you, you must do this. You must feel guilty if you don't. But instead, I think the Bible says, you must do this. Why wouldn't you? God has been so generous to you, so gracious to you. In response to that, let us give generously and graciously to him. We all have, at the same time, we have responsibilities, don't we? So we have families to look after. We have people to love and care for. We have food to put on the table. So in a varied church, it is absolutely right that our giving should look very varied. And it does. I make sure I never look at who money comes from, but I, you know, the bank account does show amounts of what comes in. And I think it's wonderful. God's people, in our variety, give money. If that's not yet you, something I'd love to talk to you about, if you're interested in thinking more about Avenue finances and, and how you can give to Avenue, if you're a part of the church family here, we believe that's part of, our, part of our worship of God. We were worshiping him in song later on. We were worshiping him in praying. We worship him as we come to his word and submit to him. We worship God as we live out the use of our money and our possessions. So we can be gracious, uh, generous and gracious. And finally, just to bring this together, we will only do those things, won't we? We will only be gracious and generous. We will only guard against greed and, and, and try to not be greedy if we have things in the right perspective. So I think we need to value things that really, val really have value. This man's mistake, he's like, oh, bigger barns, brilliant. But if he didn't die that night, they were going to burn down the next week, or they would, he would eat through it all, or, or there'd be a wheat crisis, it would all get moldy, it would all, whatever would happen. At some point, that would all become worthless. And all the shiny things that we might like, and some of it does it rather faster than others, if I was to, you know, these things, what, they're fabulous, new and exciting for a little while, aren't they? And then they, they get old, batteries fade. They break, they get thrown away, get discarded, and we get the next one. I watched a program last week, I don't know if anyone's seen this, um, called uh, Sort Your Life Out. Anyone seen Sort Your Life Out? Danny loves Sort Your Life Out. We, yeah, we, I, I love it. It's actually, it's really heartwarming. What happens, it's these, it's these families who've got themselves into situations where they've become basically hoarders, completely disorganized, and their houses are overrun with stuff. They take the stuff out of the house. They basically say, we've got a week, and we're going to sort your life out. Okay, they take everything out, and they arrange it all in an enormous warehouse. It's terrifying seeing how much stuff we might all have in our house, even if you're not quite as extreme as this. And then they go through it, bit by bit by bit by bit, trying to get rid of, get rid of, get rid of. There was one I watched the other day, very sad, actually. This man who's, he had a, two young daughters, and his wife had died when his youngest daughter was eight months old, and his house had gone to, to, to mess because he was focusing on his children. And he stood there in this warehouse, and he'd got all this lovely, amazing tech on one particular table. Cameras, phones, iPads, everything. Most of it barely touched. And he was 
brutally honest, and he said, yeah, he said, it's been a really hard four years. And he said, I, I recognize that I've had this process whereby I keep on thinking, if I buy that new thing, that will make me feel better. And he said, for about 20 minutes each time, I've got that hit. And then it fades away. So honest. <laughs> I don't think he was a Christian. Man, what would honesty for us look like? in conversations about how we submit ourselves to God in our handling of money. Life is more than money and possessions. We need to value things that really matter. So just glance down towards the end of the passage that Beth read for us. With you, verse 32 of chapter 12. Do not be afraid, Jesus says, little flock, for your father has been pleased to sell you for an exorbitant price entry into the kingdom. No, no, it doesn't say that. Your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Give you. We've been given the kingdom. We haven't had to buy it with money or possessions or time or commitment. God gives us the kingdom. We are kingdom people. If you're in Jesus, you are in the kingdom. Now live out as a kingdom person is what we're looking at. Again, as I started at the beginning with, no, no matter what we do with our money, it can't make us a Christian. We can't buy our way into heaven. But God has been pleased to give you the kingdom. So Jesus carries on, sell your possessions, give to the poor, provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What do I really treasure? You could look at my diary, you could look at my bank statement, you could probably look at the apps on my phone. You could certainly look at how much time I spend opening different apps on my phone as to whether my mind is more oriented sometimes by money or by God's word and submission to him. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In other words, the things that we treasure, the things that we think are really important, that's where our heart goes. That's what we orient to. That's why Jesus, I think, tells us again and again and again, talks about money. Be careful of money, he says. It's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than it is for a camel to get through the eye of a needle. Not because a rich person can't get into the kingdom of heaven, because it can be given to them just as to the rest of us. But because a rich person, the danger is we're obsessed with mine, 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 mine. That's why it's hard to enter the kingdom of heaven. Because to enter the kingdom of heaven means releasing our grip on anything. Anything we think we have control over. God is much bigger than money. We need to guard against things that would take us away from that. We need to guard against greed. Will you put a Rottweiler <laughs> at the gateway to your heart for greed? I don't know what, we could name it. You can't have tank, that's taken. But you could have a name for the Rottweiler that's going to guard you against greed or come into your heart and go, where's the greed? What do I need to submit to God? But we'll be generous and gracious just as God has graciously given to us. He has freely given us the kingdom. We're not being charged for it. And as God's people, we can be generous and gracious in that same way. We can be gracious with much or with little. But the key thing is, will we value things that really do have lasting value. Will we lift our eyes from the shiny and see the real shining of the Lord Jesus and eternal things? Let's pray together. Our generous, gracious, loving, free-giving God, we thank you for all that you give to us through the Lord Jesus. And thank you that it is a free gift. There is nothing that we can do to earn, to pay back, to deserve what you give for us in Jesus. Thank you for entry into the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of your people together. And I pray, Lord, these are difficult things to think about. How do we submit our money, our possessions, our dreams, our hopes, our aspirations, our daydreaming to you? Would you, by your Holy Spirit, help us to do that in a way that is godly and honoring to you? Help us not be driven by guilt, but nor by greed. Help us be generous, help us be gracious, and help us to appreciate you more and more as we think about these things. For your sake, we ask. Amen.